Good evening, everyone. Welcome to St. Mark's, uh, this uh, final lecture of the 2019 series of the Moon Lectures. Uh, thank you for your support and thank you for your presence. Um, for those of you who are not part of the St. Mark's community, you may be interested to know we're in the season of Advent, and uh, so this is an Advent wreath that's in front of me here with the four candles for the four Sundays of Advent. And we're doing a series on the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So that's why we have the big banner up here with uh, the Madonna and child, which we think is really beautiful. So as I say every time in the lectures, we have great lectures here at St. Mark's. We also have a great gathering on Sunday morning at about 10 o'clock. So <laughs> if you're interested in coming along to hear some of that, that's really great. Oh, and Christmas Eve, 5 o'clock and 9 o'clock. Might as well get my commercials in. <laughs> so, um, thank you for your support during this year. Uh, we're already looking at the 2020 season of Moon Lectures. We will be having a bonus lecture uh, that will be happening on March 27th, so in the spring rather than later in the year. And, and this is to fit in with a program going on in the life of the congregation. We're, we're doing a congregation-wide study of the book White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. And uh, we have invited Superintendent Terry Brown um, uh, from Hampton, Virginia, uh, to come uh, as we commemorate the 400th anniversary of the arrival of Africans in uh, North America. So it's uh, the arrival at Fort Monroe in the city of Hampton, Virginia, on March 27th. So uh, there will be more information to come, and those of you who are on the email list will get a reminder about that. A reminder that at the end of the lecture, I invite you to stay seated as uh, we leave and head over to the, the hall across the courtyard. Do come on over, meet our lecturer, and uh, get yourself something to eat and drink. Um, so, I'm just delighted to uh, welcome Rukmini Kalimaki here this evening and welcome her to Sacramento. It's her first time in Sacramento. Um, she's an extraordinary human being with a, a very powerful story to tell and she will be telling you some of it herself. Um, she was born in Romania and then became a refugee in Switzerland before resettling in the United States when she was 10 years old and lived in Ojai, down in Southern California. Uh, and then she went through her education and late in her 20s found herself becoming a reporter. And her life of reporting has been just extraordinary. Uh, and she has gone into some of the most dangerous places, reporting on Al-Qaeda and on ISIS, um, living in West Africa for part of that time. She can tell you all of this. You don't need me to tell, tell you all. She did want me to make sure that uh, I told you she has been nominated for the Pulitzer now four times uh, as an additional one since the report was written up. But her greatest claim to fame is that she is the mother of seven-month-old Amadeo Mikhail. <laughs> And amazingly, she is coming to us hot foot from Bucharest, Romania. She has been home with her mother and come back and headed across the continent. She's now based in New Jersey. So uh, she looks remarkably well, considering. <laughs> so thank you so much for being with us. Come on and speak to us, if you will. <laughs> and I will pick up questions from people who are not with you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much, Pastor. Um, I am indeed a California girl, so I'm very happy to uh, be back in my home state. Two years ago, I got a tip from a source saying that a member of ISIS who had gone and fought for the group in Iraq and Syria had just returned home to Canada. He had somehow gotten through airport security undetected and according to my source, this member of ISIS was now living among the general population in a suburb of a major Canadian city. If this were to be true, 
it would be a big story. Only a few hundred people from North America, from both America and Canada, have made it across the ocean to join ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Of those, only a small number have made it back home to North America, and of those that have made it back home, the vast majority are in jail. This was a man that I was told was living in nature, as it were, among the people of Canada, even though uh, he was alleged to have been a member of ISIS and to have committed crimes for the group. As a journalist who's now covered ISIS for more than five years, this was a tantalizing opportunity, an, unpre an, an, an unprecedented opportunity for me. I was able, through a series of, um, uh, of research maneuvers, to find his email address and so I wrote him an email asking if he would allow me to come and to interview him. I expected him to either not respond or else to say no, but to my surprise, he replied a few days later uh, and said yes. And a few days after that, I found myself in Canada in a hotel room with my colleague, Andy Mills, waiting for an ISIS member to come through the door. And I wanted to play for you now a clip from my podcast, Caliphate, which explains what happened next. Could we go ahead and play the clip? Test, test, that's good. So the next step is, is you and I, you know, booked a ticket. You think it would throw off the feng shui if you sat here? Mm -mm. And we flew to Canada. We're not going to say where we went. The microphone faces this way, and mm -hmm. you're projecting your voice this mm -hmm. way. You know, we set up ourselves in, in this hotel room. I texted him the, the name of the hotel, the address, uh, the room number, and he agreed to come after the end of his work day, because he was working, I believe, at a restaurant. And then we started to wait. And he was initially late by 15 minutes, then 20 minutes, then 30 minutes. We are um, we're still waiting. He says rush hour. I'm texting him and, and wondering if we're going to be, you know, stood up. About an hour now has gone by. I mean, at, at a certain point, I almost gave up. I thought, this is it. You know, we've basically just thrown away a plane ticket to Canada. And at some point, I remember that you, that you turned around to ask me, do you think there's any chance that this person is dangerous? So back to the hotel, uh, we were we were there for like what two hours? Yeah, and then suddenly, out of the blue, there was a knock at the door of our hotel room, and I was shocked because I had expected him to go to the lobby and that the lobby would call us, but instead he had managed to walk past the lobby. How are you? Thank you for coming. We were getting a tad nervous. We're like, oh my god. The traffic is really bad. It's like peak hour too. Yeah. And I opened the door and he had a hoodie on. And the hoodie was pulled so far forward that I could barely see his face. His face was in shadow. And he kept it kind of pulled down like that for some time. The man who came to see me that night asked to be called by the code name Abu Huzaifa. And in the course of the time he spent with me and with my colleague, he confessed on tape to having killed two people at ISIS's command. So if he was telling us the truth, we had met alone with a murderer in a hotel room late at night. People often ask me, why do you do this? Why do you take these risks? And I'm here tonight to tell you that I was in that hotel room because I firmly believe in speaking to the enemy, in listening to them, which is different from believing them, in trying to understand them which is different from giving them a platform. And I do this in the interest of reporting the most accurate version of events that I can. In short, I do this in the interest of truth. Next slide, please. I began covering ISIS five years ago. And in that time, like other people who are on this beat, I have received my share of threats from the terrorist group. By now, the FBI, uh, through their New York office, has contacted me and my editors a total of six times to warn me of what they consider to be credible threats against me, and in one instance, to be credible threats against me and my family. 
I wanted to play for you the recording of the last voicemail uh, that the FBI left me. And just as an aside, I realize that my name is unusual and it's difficult for people to pronounce, but it is pronounced Rukmini Kalimaki. Next slide, please. Hello, Ms. Kalamucci. This is Special Agent Angus McLaughlin with the New York FBI. Um, I was just calling to inform you that in one of our checks, we saw that um, there was a Telegram user that posted, uh, actually posted your Twitter link regarding um, archiving of uh, records, uh, ISIS records, and they posted a comment uh, that we should not let this pawn get away with this and we should slaughter her and teach journalists alike a lesson. I know from looking at our records that uh, you've gotten these duty to warn before based on your position and the line of work that you do, but you know, it's our duty. We come across this stuff to let you know. Next uh, slide, so please. Unfortunately, that's all. We should slaughter her and teach journalists like her a lesson. These are the typical kind of threats that, uh, that I have gotten. And I'm going to channel my mom for a second, who has asked me more times than I can count. Okay, I get why you're doing this. But more to the point, why do you, Rukmini, have to be the one to do this work? Why not let the government do it? And my answer is as follows. I believe that the work I do is worth it, because in the end, the war on terror is one of the most important stories of our age. To date, the war on terror has cost our government trillions of dollars, and it has cost us thousands upon thousands of lives, not just the lives of American soldiers, but also of the countless civilians that have been, caught, that have been killed in the crossfire. And yet, despite the importance of this topic, despite the expense in both, uh, in both dollars and blood, what I've learned on this beat is that there is an unbelievable amount of misinformation about the war on terror. Why is that? I believe that's because this is the only beat, at least the only beat that I can think of, where reporters routinely, and as a matter of course, speak to only one side of the issue. We speak to government officials, we speak to military sources, we speak to State Department directors, but most coverage of ISIS and of Al-Qaeda before it doesn't even try to reach the other side. And that's because the other side, in the case of ISIS and in the case of Al-Qaeda, is what many of us see as the worst people in the world. People who have carried out crimes that are so horrific, so awful, so vulgar, so brutal, that they are akin to monsters. Speaking to the other side is therefore an exercise in speaking to monsters. But I wanted to describe to you my personal journey to this beat, which convinced me that the only accurate way to report on this phenomenon is by also speaking to the group itself, by also seeking to speak to the enemy. In 2011, exactly a decade, after the events uh, at the World Trade Center and the events of 9-11, I was named the West Africa Bureau Chief for the Associated Press. Next slide, please. My job was to cover a 20-country stretch uh, of West and Central Africa, an absolutely futile and impossible uh, endeavor. My territory stretched from Mauritania all the way uh, up in the, the northwest corner of Africa down to the Congo in Central Africa. And one of the countries on my beat was the country of Mali. Next slide, please. A year into my new job in 2012, a group calling itself Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb invaded the northern half of the country of Mali. And in a matter of weeks, the jihadists took over the entire northern half of Mali. I don't know if you can see um, the little town of Duenza, which is roughly in the center of Mali. Um, they took over everything north of that. When I got back to my desk and I crunched the numbers, we realized that in, in the course of three weeks, this entity that once again was calling itself Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, they had managed to seize a territory that was equal in size to all of Afghanistan. Next slide, please. The jihadists came in convoys of SUVs, 
They took over cities and villages. They opened an Islamic tribunal. Women who didn't cover up were initially fined, and later they were flogged. Thieves had their hands cut off. Highway robbers had their foot and their hand cut off. They began uh, uh, taxing the population. And in retrospect, they did in Mali much what we later saw ISIS do in Iraq and Syria. I did my best to report the story, but I was based in Senegal, which is several countries away from Mali. And it was simply too dangerous to go to the area that was under jihadist rule. The jihadists had actually come out. They had issued a fatwa saying that any foreign reporters who were caught in the territory would pay the consequences. So we couldn't go there. And so I covered this beat, much like every other reporter. I called officials in Washington. I requested meetings at the State Department. I went to see the political attache, the defense attache, um, and uh, diplomats, including ambassadors, at the various Western embassies, both in Mali and in the surrounding countries. And based on what these people told me, and, and mind you, these are people with fancy titles, ambassadors, diplomats, State Department directors. Based on what these people told me, I developed the view of the terror group uh, occupying Mali that I later learned was not just flawed, but flat out wrong. Next slide, next slide please. You see, I started on this beat in 2012. It was less than a year after the death of Osama bin Laden, who had been killed by Navy SEALs in Pakistan. 2012 was also an election year. It was the, the, the year when President Obama was elected to a second four-year term. And back then, the Obama administration was touting the killing of Osama bin Laden as the major foreign policy success of their first term in office. And the narrative that was being communicated to reporters like myself was that bin Laden had been like the head of the snake. By killing him, you had cut off the head of the snake. And what happens to the body when you cut off the head of the snake? It just withers away. What they meant by that um, was that the group itself had been decapitated, that its members were on the run, that the organization overall had been decimated, and that these little groups around the world that carried the Al-Qaeda name, like the one in Mali that I was covering, remember it called itself Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, these little groups, I was told, had no real connection with, with the real Al-Qaeda. There was no connective tissue between the fighters in Mali and Al-Qaeda's central organization in, uh, in the Gulf and in Pakistan and Afghanistan. In fact, that was the term I kept hearing. No real connective tissue between the jihadists in Mali and Al-Qaeda overall. Next slide, please. Everything changed for me uh, a few months later, in 2013, in January of 2013, when the Malian uh, government uh, 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 reached out to the French president and asked for French forces to come to help Malian troops take back the northern half of their country that had fallen to this terrorist entity. I was among dozens of reporters uh, who showed up in the capital of Mali, in Bamako, and I followed behind these soldiers here. Uh, as they took village by village and city by city back from the jihadists. And uh, about two weeks into their operation, I reached the city of Timbuktu um, uh, days after it was liberated. By the way, hands up if you knew that Timbuktu is a real place. Yeah. I get this, I get this, this question uh, surprisingly often. Um, <laughs> Timbuktu is very much a real place. Uh, next slide, please. This is actually the Medina, the, the main market in Timbuktu, um, uh, a couple of days after French forces had taken Timbuktu and had flushed out uh, the terrorist entity. I showed up uh, in Timbuktu along with all of these other reporters, and it was in Timbuktu that locals began taking me to the buildings in the city that had been occupied by the terrorist fighters. They took me to a bank that had been turned into the seat of the, the Islamic police. They, take, they took me to uh, what used to be the best uh, hotel in town, which had been their Islamic tribunal, and so on. And it was in the buildings that this group had occupied for roughly 10 months that, to my surprise, I found thousands of pages of the group's internal correspondence. It had literally been left on the floor, in overturned filing cabinets, and, in, uh, and on the shelves of the closets uh, in uh, the office uh, buildings that they, had, uh, that they had squatted in. And those letters showed me 
that for some of the most basic decisions that the jihadists in Mali were taking, the fighters in Mali were seeking and were receiving direct guidance from Al-Qaeda's senior leadership in the Gulf, in direct contradiction to what officials in Washington had told reporters like me. Remember, officials were telling reporters that there was no connection between this group um, in, uh, in Mali. In fact, they were going so far as to say that this group in Mali had basically just taken on the Al-Qaeda name opportunistically. They were, they were saying that they were criminals and thugs and drug dealers, and they had taken on the Al-Qaeda name to scare people. But there was no actual connection between the guys in Timbuktu and uh, Al-Qaeda Central. Next slide, please. But it was in the third building that I searched that I found this letter here. This is one of several pages of a letter signed by somebody named Nasser al-Waheshi. Next slide, please. Who was Nasser al-Waheshi? Nasser al-Waheshi was this man here. He was no less than Osama bin Laden's former personal secretary. And in 2012, when he was writing the letter that I was now holding in my hand, he had risen to the rank of the general manager of the entire Al-Qaeda organization. He was the senior manager of this group. Next slide, please. He was in fact considered so important inside the Al-Qaeda hierarchy that the State Department had issued a bounty for his arrest of $10 million. Not one million, not two, not three, not four. $10 million for information leading to this guy's capture. So while Washington was telling journalists like me that there was no connective tissue between the guys in Mali and Al-Qaeda, here I was holding a letter that, in fact, even referenced and had a shout out to the fighters in Timbuktu. Next slide, please. Kindly convey my greetings to all of our brothers, and particularly the heroes of Timbuktu, is what, um, is what he wrote. This is one of just many letters uh, that I found uh, in, uh, in Mali in the six weeks that I was there reporting on the story that turned on its head what officials in Washington, and also I would say in Paris and in other Western capitals, would have me and other journalists believe. Next slide, please. I found the Al-Qaeda papers in early 2013, and they changed the course of my professional life. I spent a year translating and analyzing the documents, and I realized then that a much more interesting a much more revealing way to report on, on, on Al-Qaeda and later on ISIS, which is a group that grew out of Al-Qaeda, was through the group itself, not just through officials. Of course, I speak to officials. I have Pentagon, State Department, etc. sources, but not just through them, through the documents that the group leaves behind and eventually through members of the terrorist group that I was able to speak to. You see, the documents that I showed you the ones that I found in Mali on the floors of the buildings that they had uh, occupied, those documents are not propaganda. Those documents were never meant for publication. They were internal letters, memos, notes between fighters and commanders that, that discussed private matters uh, of concern to the terrorist group and that were meant for their eyes alone. In 2014, I was hired to cover Al-Qaeda and ISIS by the New York Times. And I began applying this philosophy, speaking to the enemy, in how I covered ISIS. And over five different trips uh, to northern Iraq and later to Syria, I was able to amass a trove of, of 15,000 pages of ISIS's internal records. Next slide, please. I picked them up in buildings like this one. This is literally what they look like. These are ISIS records uh, on the floor of, um, of one of the office buildings that they used. I entered these buildings um, with the Iraqi troops who were embedding me, and with the permission of the officers uh, who accompanied me, I was able to pick up what they did not consider to be useful for their own intelligence exercise. I wanted to show you how the ISIS files I found helped us at the New York Times dispel some of the misinformation we have been fed about ISIS. So let me take you back to the beginning of ISIS. Five years ago, they swept across Iraq and Syria. They took an enormous stretch of territory. It was equal in size to all of Great Britain. And as we know, they declared that territory a caliphate 
and a state. Next slide, please. And from that moment on, reporters and analysts began referring to that project as ISIS's so-called state. Have you guys heard that? Yeah? So state was in quotes, or it was prefaced by the word so-called. I know my own newspaper has, has used that term. We called it a so-called state. Why? Because we believe that ISIS is a terrorist group. And what does a terrorist group know about governing? We called it a so-called state because we could not fathom that a, that a group as brutal, as violent, as vicious as ISIS could also be interesting, interested in administering territory, much less good at it. But I wanted to show you some of the documents that I picked up in buildings like the one that I just showed you. Next slide, please. Does anyone know what this is? What's that? Loud? Okay, this is a document from ISIS's DMV. Okay. I'm not kidding. They called it the Islamic State Department of Motor Vehicles. Not kidding, okay? This is a contract uh, um, that, uh, that basically officiates the sale of a Toyota Corolla between the man on that side of the, of the slide to this man here. Um, and I wanted to show you a translation of, uh, of the file and the contract conditions that ISIS imposed. Next slide, please. The seller and the buyer, ISIS writes, the seller and the buyer have been provided in the presence of an Islamic officer the address of the seller to protect the rights of the buyer. It also goes on to say that the buyer should inspect the car before signing the contract. This is standard, you know, contract stuff. But what you see here is the Islamic State, a terrorist group, acting as both the protector and the enforcer of private property rights, just as the DMV might do so here uh, in Sacramento. Next slide, please. Does anyone know what this is? Yes, bravo. This is an ISIS birth certificate. Um, it's, <laughs> let's go to the translation page. Next slide. Um, you see at the, at the top that this is uh, printed on the Islamic State's Ministry of Health stationery. Uh, top right, you see that the certificate has a serial number. I found several of these, uh, and indeed, they were keeping a serialized record of births in the caliphate. These records were found not just in the town where I picked them up, but in, also in places that were hundreds of miles apart. So there seemed to be a concerted effort to issue birth certificates to children born under the, the flag of the caliphate in, in that territory. This particular certificate is for um, a little girl named Shahed. She was born in 2016. She should be about three years old now. It says that she was four kilograms at birth. It has the name of her mom and her dad uh, and of the hospital attendant um, who signed uh, her birth form. Next slide, please. This is a child's me uh, medical certificate. And it's specifically a certificate attesting to the examination that this little girl went through before she was able to enroll in an ISIS-run school. Uh, next slide. You see that it's printed on the Islamic State Nineveh province uh, stationery. Nineveh province was the province around the city of Mosul, which was a city of one million people that ISIS uh, seized and controlled. Uh, it's a medical, medical examination for students entering the 1438 scholastic year. This is the Islamic calendar for 2017. This is several years into ISIS's state, um, and it's being issued at a point in time when, uh, when, when the, the, the Iraqi military, with the help of uh, the American-backed coalition, had already taken uh, huge chunks of ISIS's territory back, but they were still doing this even as their territory was falling. Next slide. The examination that this little girl had to go through in included several steps. They checked her eyesight. They checked her ability to hear and talk. They did an overall health uh, examination. But I want you to look uh, in, the, in the sentence that's right above the box. Do you see what it says? Vaccinations complete. OK. Next slide, please. I'm including this slide just as a point of comparison. Um, ISIS is a brutal terrorist group, but I find it ironic that even they seem to know to vaccinate their children. Okay. 
Next slide, please. Um, this is a form from ISIS's Ministry of Services, also called its Ministry of Public Works. And it documents a troubleshooting visit uh, that ISIS engineers paid to a villager's home uh, after th that particular village villager had complained that uh, they were having power outages. And what you see, it's, it's a multi-page form with diagrams, etc. And it shows how ISIS, once again a terrorist group, went about troubleshooting uh, a, a power outage problem. Next slide. Here's the translation. This is what ISIS is writing. After doing a site survey for the house of Enod Mahdi Atia, who lives in the village of Abu Lahaf, we concluded that it is experiencing a weak electrical current because of the length of the input cable, and it needs two columns to be connected to the electrical current, as shown in the diagram in the survey attached, regards with appreciation the Islamic State's Ministry of Services. Right? So in addition to killing people, ISIS was also fix fixing people's electricity problems. In the slides I've just shown you, uh, I have shown you um, uh, the stationery of ISIS's Ministry of Services, ISIS's Ministry of Public Works, and ISIS's Ministry of Health. I wondered if one, one of you could guess how many ministries ISIS ran during uh, the period that they, that they held territory in Iraq and Syria. 18? Almost, it's a little bit high. A little lower. A little lower. So um, uh, a year into uh, their caliphate project, ISIS put out a video where they outlined uh, the structure of the caliphate, and they said that they had uh, that they had opened 14 ministries. I remember sitting at my desk when that when that document came came, came through, and even though I'm so steeped uh, in the study of this group, even I at the time remembered thinking that sounds like an exaggeration. How could a terrorist group be running 14 ministries? But in the trips that I made to Iraq and to Syria, I ended up collecting the stationery, so forms like the ones you have seen here, from 11 of those 14 ministries. Colleagues of mine, analysts that I work with, have collected the stationery for the other three. So just think about it. If you're issuing stationery, if you're going to the trouble of printing stationery with something that says ISIS Ministry of Health, I think it's a fair assumption to say that that ministry at some level was functioning. So this group really was running 14 ministries in the territory that they held. I went to the dictionary to look up the definition of the word state. Next slide, please. And I found, uh, I, I found this definition here, and I'm looking at definition number two. A nation or territory considered as an organized political community under one government. ISIS's state was one that was recognized by no one other than themselves. But did it behave as an organized political community under one government? It absolutely did. And this is one of the things that we refuse to acknowledge and that we downplayed and that, in my opinion, uh, clouded our perspective on what this group really was and the threat that it posed. Next slide, please. Let me give you another example of how we got ISIS wrong. You might have heard that the Islamic State has been described as the world's richest terrorist group. So let me ask you, what do you think was the main source of financing for ISIS? Oil. oil. Taxes. Can I see a show of hands of how many people think oil? Okay. How many think taxes? Okay. So the, it seems like the oil vote in the, in the room uh, has more. Let me see oil once more. I think it's oil. Okay. Um, you guys, I have to say, are, are more knowledgeable than most people I speak to. <laughs> Next slide, please. Story after story in 2014 and beyond touted the hundreds of millions of dollars that ISIS was raking in from oil. Oil was described as the main revenue source for the Islamic State, and this had real policy implications. Next slide. The main strategy that the coalition used for trying to uh, cut off uh, ISIS's financing was the targeting of oil installations like you see here, 
Uh, they were literally bombing oil refineries, um, uh, oil uh, centers, and by the end of uh, the caliphate period, they even went so far as to start to bomb the convoys uh, of oil trucks that were, that were taking the oil out of uh, the area. Next slide. By 2017, the coalition triumphantly declared that they had erased 90% of ISIS's oil revenue. This particular story, which was dated 2017, says, the US-led coalition battling the Islamic State has slashed a militant group's oil revenues by more than 90% over the past two years, all but cutting off its chief source of funds. What do you think would happen to a group if they were completely out of money? They might get desperate. And I, I would argue that if they were out of money, you would expect that they wouldn't pose a robust threat and that they wouldn't be as uh, prevalent um, as they were. This story is dated 2017, and it took another two years before ISIS lost uh, the last village uh, under its control, which happened um, a few months ago earlier this year. You would not expect the group to hold on for another two years um, if they were completely out of money. But in fact, uh, ISIS did co continue to hold on to that land. And the reason it was, in part, able to do so is because oil was never ISIS's chief source of funds. This is another example to me of how early reporting and, and official statements got this group wrong. Let me show you a pie chart. Next slide, please. This is a study that was done in 2015 by the Center for the Analysis uh, of Terrorism um, in, uh, in Paris, which is a group that, in my opinion, has done some of the best work on ISIS. At the very top, in blue, you see that oil, in 2015, was 25% of ISIS's ledger. This is at the height of ISIS's territorial control, and that portion of the ISIS pie chart began to precipitous, precipitously decrease from that point on as the coalition was targeting oil wells. So at the very height of uh, the oil production in ISIS-controlled territories, it amounted to a quarter of ISIS's uh, pocketbook. I don't know about you guys, but if I was to lose 25% of my paycheck uh, from one week to the next, I'd be very upset. I would be sending all sorts of emails to my editor. I might even go into HR to complain. But I would still, perhaps by the skin of my teeth, but I would still be able to pay my mortgage, my car payment, uh, and, and my sandwich that I have at lunch. By contrast, I want you to look at um, the, the band that is down here in purple that says extortion, 33%. Extortion is another word for taxes. Yeah? Okay. So taxes, extortion, um, money that they were taking from the population, that in 2015 was 33%. If you look at the other bands on, in this direction in light blue, you see that cement was 4%, agriculture was 7%, natural gas, uh, 14, etc. If you add up all of that stuff, so, ex so taxes on people, 33%, and then the commerce that was happening under the Islamic State that was both being taxed by the group and that in some instances was being run by the group, that band is roughly two-thirds of the ISIS budget. Okay? That is the bulk of how ISIS made its money. And the problem with that source of financing, taxation of people and of the industries and commerce that they generate, is the following. It's much harder to get rid of that source of financing. And let me explain to you why. There are different estimates as to how many people lived under ISIS rule. But uh, people agree that it was anywhere between 8 to 12 million people that were living under ISIS control between the years of 2014 um, uh, and, uh, and 2019. 8 to 12 million people. Every person that lived under ISIS rule, that, pro that, that produced any sort of income, had to pay taxes to this group. Next slide, please. They issued blue booklets like this one to business owners. This is called uh, the zakat booklet. Zakat is a form of, uh, it's an Islamic tax. 
and every business owner had to pay a percentage of their yearly revenue to ISIS. Uh, the percentage differed based on which industry you were in, but the basic point is that everybody from shopkeepers to the guy who had a single sheep had to pay a percentage of their yearly revenue to the group. Next slide, please. This particular zakat booklet is for this man here. His name is Abdul Rahman. Um, he's a farmer, uh, and it indicates here how much he paid on his wheat harvest. The key thing is Abdul Rahman, the person that you see here, he's not a member of ISIS. He's just a farmer who's living, most likely by force, under Islamic State rule. What I learned from people who were living in the formal caliphate is that this little booklet was almost as important as your ID when you were moving around the caliphate. You had to show it at practically every single checkpoint. Um, this man uh, told me that when he was trying to take his wheat and his barley to market, he had the bales on the back of a truck, he would reach a checkpoint before the market, and they would immediately ask to see this booklet, to see had he paid his tax due to the Islamic State. He couldn't actually sell his produce um, without, without proving to Islamic State officials that he had paid the taxes that were owed. How do you target this tax base? I've shown you how you target uh, the oil installations, but how do you take out this particular source of revenue? Can anyone tell me? Remember, this guy's not a member of ISIS, right? Well, you could bomb his barley field, right? Uh, or you could kill him. You could bomb him, a civilian. Neither of those are things that you can do under international law, despite what some politicians have, uh, have said, okay? You can't just randomly bomb civilian areas of, uh, of, of, of a territory, even if it's under Islamic State rule, under international norms. So the only way that you get rid of this type of revenue is by physically removing ISIS from the territory that they controlled. And I'm going to show you the types of receipts that I picked up in the former caliphate to show you just how much money they were making from things that are as run-of-the-mill as wheat, as barley, as flour, sheep's milk, uh, very unexotic forms of financing. Next slide, please. This is a briefcase uh, that I picked up uh, uh, in July of 2018 on the very day that the city of Mosul was liberated. I found it in the last city block that had been under ISIS control uh, in a building that had been smashed uh, with airstrikes. We pulled it out, uh, and it was you, you can still see a little bit of the white from the rubble powder. And it was chock full uh, of documents. Next slide, please. Among the documents, I found this ID here. It's for a man named Yasser Issa Hassan who happened to be a senior emir of the group. Senior emir means a, um, a manager. In fact, he was the head of something called the trade division of ISIS's Ministry of Agriculture. He was in charge of trade for the Islamic State in the agriculture area. Next slide, please. In the briefcase, we found dozens of spreadsheets like this one. What this document shows is revenue from four different flour mills in the Mosul area. Next slide. These are flour mills that had been seized by the Islamic State that were still being run by civilians, but that ISIS was now taking a share uh, of the profit from. And the, the, the spreadsheet that I just showed you reveals that on a single day in 2016, ISIS made 69 million Iraqi dinars from the sale of flour from just four flour mills, again on a single day. Next slide. 69 million Iraqi dinars, what is that? That's $58,000, okay? $58,000 from the sale of flour on a single day in one little area of territory controlled by ISIS. Can we go back a slide? Now, I want you to notice the date, 20 October 2016. That date is important because it was, it was a couple of days earlier, in October of 2016, that coalition forces entered the city of Mosul and began taking back this territory. And this transaction happens in Mosul. So even as American tanks and Iraqi tanks were literally rolling in to this area, ISIS made 
almost $60,000 from the sale of flour um, uh, from these mills that they controlled. Next slide. Um, we found in this, in just this one briefcase, we found spreadsheets that went from October 2016, November 2016, December 2016, all the way into 2017. So that, that was the period of time that Mosul was being taken back by the coalition. And even as they were losing neighborhood by neighborhood, the group was making money hand over fist, um, selling very simple and banal things uh, like wheat and barley. This particular spreadsheet here shows the gross sale of wheat and barley in the Mosul area for a one week period. Next slide, please. It uh, totals uh, 1.4 billion Iraqi dinars. Next slide. What's 1.4 billion Iraqi dinars? It's $1.2 million. Okay, in just this briefcase that I showed you, we, we added up all of the transactions and just in that one man's briefcase, there was $19 million, $19 million of transactions just for things like wheat, barley, flour, sheep's milk, etc. okay? So this, this was the core of their financing. This is how this group held on. It's how the group continues to hold down even now because even though they don't hold territory, they are still running a shadow government in some of these areas and they're forcing farmers to pay up, okay? Um, and again, this is a source of financing that is very hard to get rid of because at the core of it are human beings, civilians, that under international norms, you cannot harm, right? So again, this is an example of how we got the group wrong and how we're able to correct our misperceptions by going to the group itself, by speaking to the enemy, either through their, their records or through them themselves. Next slide, please. To me, these documents are like a window into an unseen world. They help check and they help correct official assertions about this group. They give us insight that you can't find anywhere else, in my opinion. And in my opinion, they provide the most authentic information about this entity. The documents that they've left behind have been one of the main avenues that I've used to try to understand this entity. But the other avenue is trying to speak to them in person, if I can. I first began speaking uh, to them online. Uh, this is back in 2014. But when you're speaking to these people online, they're almost always using a made-up identity. And as a result of that, you're not 100% sure, uh, or journalistically, I should say, you're not 100% sure that you're speaking to the person you think you're speaking to. From speaking to them online, I graduated to speaking to them in prisons. There are now thousands uh, of ISIS members that are incarcerated in Iraq, in Syria, in Tajikistan, in Europe. These are all the places that I've gone to to try to speak to them in, uh, in jailhouse interviews. But prison interviews are problematic for another reason, which is that the people there are incarcerated. They often bring them out to you in handcuffs. And even though I always preface an interview by saying to the prisoner, you're free to not speak to me if you don't want to speak to me, there's always this element of, is this person feeling coerced? Is this person really free to speak to me? And that brings me back to that hotel room in Canada. It's exceedingly rare to be able to have access to a real member of ISIS who has returned home to a Western country where he or she has rights, and to be able to interview that person in a setting where they are completely free to speak to me or to not speak to me. And that's why I had to go to Canada when I got the chance. It was the fall of 2016, and by some stroke of luck, uh, we got to that hotel room and we interviewed Hussefa for, for several hours after he had returned from Syria, and just 12 hours before Canadian law enforcement came and banged on his door. That created this unbelievable opening. He had defected from ISIS. He felt what he said was enormous guilt over the atrocities he had carried out. He had also managed to come home to Canada. He expected to be arrested at the airport, but he wasn't. And I think that gave him the sense that he was in the clear. He literally said to me, I have slipped through the cracks. And it was for that reason, I think, that he opened up and he shared things with me that he has not shared uh, with, with other journalists uh, and that he has not shared with, with the investigators that have uh, come to interrogate him since. And I wanted to share with you in closing just one last clip that points to the things that we can learn 
if we're willing to take the time to listen to these people. When we see the horrific images that ISIS have, has put out, beheadings, uh, the burning of the Jordanian pilot, uh, the rape of Yazidi girls and women, you get the impression that this is a group of young men that are sadists, that, that, that are like serial killers, that these people enjoy being cruel, that they enjoy inflicting pain, that they enjoy taking a human life. What Huzaifa did for me in the course of the hours he spent uh, with me in that hotel room is he described the mental steps that he had to go through to be able to kill on the orders of this terrorist organization. And it wasn't one step, and it wasn't several. It was dozens of steps before he was able to do that. And what was apparent to me in the time that we spent together is that it was hard for him. It emotionally damaged him to kill another human being. This clip is four minutes long. Um, I should warn you that it is graphic, and so if you'd like to excuse yourself, that, um, that is fine. I want you to listen to the pace of his breathing and to the number of times that he swallows as he describes to us what happened. Let's play the clip, please. So at a certain point, you decide that you want to quit. Yeah. Can you, can you, was there one moment or a series of moments? The second time I did the kill, I killed someone. Uh, this guy was a drug dealer. I had to stab him in the heart. Why did you have to do that? That's his punishment. And why were you chosen to do this? Is um, I was I was just about ready to go to riots though. He, they needed me. They were kind of preparing me, so I was due to go tra into that training uh, a couple of weeks from that time. Yeah. They just had to vet me one more time. People were watching. Yep, including my superiors and other fighters and locals. Who else was there watching? There'd be other hispas, like, you know, new guys, you know, regular streets people would watch. A lot of kids watch. How old is he right I think he's 30-something, um, in his 30s. He was wearing an orange jumpsuit, slight beard, cut face, like square. He was blindfolded. It was like a black leather, rubbery type blindfold. We tied his hands with this wire thing. Did you mask your face? Yeah, I did. I masked my face. Did it help to have that? Oh yeah, yeah. No one could see your face. It helped a lot. They're like, you know, the guy just like talks to the crowd, addresses them what's about to happen. And I'm just trying to build up the, the courage to do it. After that, I stabbed him. The blood was just, it was warm. And it sprayed everywhere. And the guy cried, was crying and screaming. He did not die after the first time. The second time or so, he probably just flunched over. That was... You know, how hard is it to put a knife into somebody? It's hard. I had to stab him multiple times. So, and then we put him up on a cross and I had to leave the dagger in his heart. And then there was a sign that said, uh, it had a code on it, and like 166, drugs and alcohol type offense. Yeah. How did, how did it feel? Um, it just, at the time, it just felt Disgusting, but numb at the same time, like gloomy-ish. I just instantly thought, I'm a psycho killer now. Like, what the hell did I just do? That night, I just, I couldn't sleep at all. I stayed up all night. I got really sick again. I just kept thinking of the guy. I don't, I can always, I can still feel having my hand on his shoulder. Yeah, just, yeah, holding him. I was pushing him into the knife too. I could still feel that. I could, 
you know, stabbing someone in the heart like that. I just kept re replaying the hand action of my hand going there. I just kept thinking of different things. It was a rush of thoughts in my head. I stabbed him. The blood was just everywhere. What the hell did I just do? I'm a psycho killer now. I didn't give him a chance to repent. I stabbed him. If I die after doing something like this, how will I face God? No, no, no. What the hell did I just do? Then I started thinking of my family. What if they were here? What if that had to be my dad? You're basically killing your own parents in a way. Maybe that jihad that I'm doing right now is the wrong type of jihad. Maybe... No, this isn't it. This isn't the right life for me. I played that clip for you because I wanted you to hear the trauma in his voice. Could you hear it? Yeah. That trauma to me is a sign that despite the horrific thing that he did, there's a baseline humanity that I think is still there and can be accessed. In order to be able to get someone like Josefa to open up and share that kind of thing with me, I feel that you need to approach these people, human being to human being. That has always been my credo. I thank you for inviting me here tonight, and I would really welcome your questions now. Okay, uh, questions. Actually, Michael, would you put the lights up, please, for us so that I can see? <laughs> okay. I have about, okay, three questions. First, sure. uh, how did you learn Arabic? Second, when you collected the documents, how were you allowed to keep them and not be, say, forced to turn them over to other intelligence agencies? <laughs> And third, since you've been publishing these reports, have there been changes in the representations of officials of what mm -hmm. they told you about ISIS to what is now? Sure. Uh, so your first question, um, uh, how do I speak Arabic? I don't. I work with very talented translators <laughs> um, who have helped me through this process. Uh, as just one example, when I was in Mali, um, I didn't yet have a network of translators like I do, I do now. And one of the documents I found was clearly some sort of arms manual. It was pretty thick and it had pictures of something that looked like a missile launcher or something else. And in Timbuktu, I, I, I could only find one person who spoke Arabic. The problem is he spoke Arabic, but he didn't speak French, which was the language that I was speaking. So I remember sitting with him and he said, une bombe sur la terre et une bombe dans l'air, as the title of the thing, which translates as a bomb on the ground and a bomb in the air. I said, that can't be right. That makes no sense. A bomb on the ground and a bomb in the air. What, what he meant was surface-to-air missile. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, what had happened is Libya had just fallen. Uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi's regime had fallen. And uh, the Gaddafi arsenal of, uh, of SA-7A and SA-7B surface-to-air missiles, which are very dangerous, they're able to take out a commercial plane uh, in mid-flight. It looks like, it looks like a, a poster uh, uh, tube and you hold it on your shoulder and it has um, a honing device and you can literally aim it at a plane uh, and it can take it out in midair. There had been rumors that, uh, that those weapons in Libya had made it into the hands of the jihadists in Mali and this ended up being the very first proof. But I wouldn't have known that if I wasn't able to get a better translator because a bomb in the ground and a bomb in the air doesn't exactly sound, sound the same. So um, that's your first question. Uh, your second question was how, is, how was I allowed to take these things? So here's the, the, the curious thing. I have now collected over 20,000 pages of Al-Qaeda and ISIS records. And the amazing thing is I always expect somebody to burst into my hotel room or, uh, or, or to come to my house or whatever and demand these things. And it's never happened. Um, and I don't completely understand what's happening. Uh, it seemed in Iraq, uh, actually it was quite clear in Iraq that we were not the first people going through these places. I would sometimes see boot marks on the documents um, that, that I was picking up. 
What I noticed is in um, in buildings like the one that I showed you that was that was strewn with records, you would you would go to the courtyard, and in the courtyard you would find you know those big tower computer uh, terminals. You would find a whole bunch of of terminals in the courtyard with the hard drive yanked out. So I think what intelligence services were doing is they would go to these buildings and they were looking for the electronics. Uh, they would then look through the documents and as, as far as Iraqi intelligence, what they seemed to be looking for were, were lists of names because they were, they were looking to prosecute people and they were looking to understand uh, the network, you know, who's who in this network. But they didn't seem to have any interest in these governing documents. Um, and I don't completely understand that, but that, but I mean, they, they, they repeatedly expressed uh, surprise uh, so, and some level of humor at the fact that I was interested in these records myself. And it went so far as um, uh, in some of the places that we are going to, the Iraqi military was actually burning these records, actually burning them. Um, I wondered if we could go back to the very last slide. Okay, I'm going to play um, a clip for you now, uh, which is the moment that Hawk, who's my translator, and I got to a building that we had been told had some ISIS records. You're going to hear my voice, and you're going to hear, hear in English Hawk, who's my translator, and then you're going to hear the Iraqi military explain to us that they had orders to burn everything that was that was inside. Can you please play it? He says, he says sometimes. Uh, <laughs> he says you are the first guy. Uh, first people to ask about uh, documents actually so so uh, every time we find some documents we just burn it oh my god no are you serious you burn it this is anything that belongs to Islamic state we just burn it tell him you can understand you can learn so much more about this terrorist group by looking at these documents طريقة تنظيمية مالتهم شلون هيكلية الدولة الإسلامية. هيكلية كلها عندي أجيب لك إياها من أصغر مقاتل الروالي. تفاصيلهم كاملة عندي. مو لازم لازم من خلال كتب رسمية. أي وثائق رسمية موجودة. ياخذ الكنايس. ياخذ الكنايس. لا لا لا. هاي إشكالية خارجية. تصوير تصورها. هذه استعمال غنايم لهم. الله يعينه. There is a church here. It's called the the booty church. The booty or غنايم center. So the, this thing is like the booty, the war booty. Yeah. And there are some, some papers in there as well, if you want to go. Thank you. We ended up walking into this church. It was literally a church that had been taken over by ISIS. And it had been completely burned. But on the edges of the rooms, um, some of the documents had, uh, had survived. And those are the documents that I picked up. And it had been burned not by ISIS, but by the Iraqi military. Right? So that gives you a sense of, uh, of how they viewed uh, these records. They're, they're, not, they're not necessarily viewed as, um, as important. What was your third question? Oh, has there been a change? Yes. Yes, there has, but it's, it, it's really, you, you know that, that picture of Sisyphus, you know, pushing the rock? That's how I feel. <laughs> I feel that you're, you know, you're constantly like pushing this enormous uh, weight uh, up, uh, up a hill, and for every step forward, you're kind of shoved back. Um, but little by little, for example, when I, when I was doing this talk in uh, 2015, the entire room would put up their hand for oil. Now, there is a growing sense that ISIS also made money from taxes. It's a minority view. It was the, the, oil, the oil voters had, uh, had more of their hands up in this room. But you're starting, there's starting to be a general knowledge that, that is catching up you know, uh, with this. Uh, next question, please. Yes, how you doing? Yeah, I guess I get like three questions also. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess first one would be uh, when you go into these these areas. Yeah. Are you always uh, accompanied by uh, uh, someone that can help protect you? Or are you just going in on, on faith? <laughs> yeah. <that you laughs> yes. And 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 then uh, two. Do you think uh, who are they domestically? The ISIS domestic uh, domestically created group, or do you think that they are created because of outside interference? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that there's uh, maybe a protection 
type of group that is created to fight against outside forces. Uh, mm -hmm. I have one more question, but I can't. I can't think of it. <laughs> okay, so on um, on the security, uh, I was in Africa for seven years uh, as first the correspondent and later the bureau chief of the Associated Press. And in that period of time, I always traveled by myself or with a photographer and with a with a translator. Um, that meant that we made our own security decisions. Uh, we would assess the terrain and, uh, and, and we would decide whether it was safe uh, or not to go. That changed for me when I joined the Times in 2014. I joined in 2014, which was a couple of years after the death of my colleague, Anthony Shadid, uh, who died in Syria. Um, and, uh, and his death uh, spurred a series of changes um, at my news organization and later, I think, in others as well. And now in Iraq and Syria, when I go there, um, on most of my trips, unless I'm just like in Baghdad, uh, but on most of my trips when I'm out in the countryside, I am, uh, I am accompanied by a security advisor. In our case, the security advisor is a British Special Forces member. Um, but the thing to understand is these security advisors are former, former military themselves, but they're not armed. They're not armed because as journalists, part of our credo is that we are civilians. So we can't be armed. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, there was a controversy about a colleague of mine uh, years ago at the beginning of the Iraq war who was caught with a pistol. <laughs> Uh, and poor guy, he was carrying a pistol because he was scared out of, out of his mind, as we, as we sometimes are in these areas, and he wanted to be able to protect himself. Um, but that was judged by the journalistic community to be not legitimate. You know, we, are, we have to be seen as civilians. As it is, we're already accused of being spies, of being tools of the American government, um, and that would only get worse if we were, if we were armed you know, uh, in these areas. So we go into these areas with a lot of preparation, um, with a lot of forethought. Uh, and it means that trips become much longer than they used to be. Uh, there's a lot of you know, sitting around in a hotel uh, and waiting for the exactly right moment uh, to go. And when we go, it's, we're, we're not hanging out. You know, we're going straight to an interview, a second interview, a, another thing, and then boom, we come back out. And that's just what we have to do in this day and age. Your second question was about whether this is external. So ISIS is an outgrowth of Al-Qaeda. Um, and Al-Qaeda did not exist in Iraq uh, at the time of the US invasion, unfortunately. The US invasion, as we now know, uh, was, was something that was carried out using false intelligence, uh, false pretenses. Um, it's, been, it's been correctly portrayed as a failure of intelligence, and sadly, it was also a failure of reporting um, by the majority of news organizations in America, my own included, that essentially took official assertions at face value um, and, and repeated them uh, and created a case for for that invasion. So in the case of ISIS, yes, you could say that this is a force that was external to Iraq and Syria. But um, the, the founder of the group that becomes ISIS, uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, he happened to be Jordanian. He moved into Iraq and saw an opportunity to create this entity in the chaos that was created by um, the US invasion. But he leaned on uh, extremists that were already there. So although he came from outside, he found a petri dish uh, of, of folks uh, who, were willing to, uh, who were willing to side with him um, in that particular project. Hello, I have a couple questions also. One, something you just said triggered one. Yes. It, do you see American mainstream news organizations learning the lesson from Iraq, what you just mentioned, it still seems that we kind of fall into these traps, especially when we're afraid. Um, so do you, have you seen any fundamental changes? That's my first question. The second question that I was, had prepared before that was, what's your best case scenario if, if we embrace this human to human sort of uh, approach to, to an organization like ISIS? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, or are there any models, even on a small scale, that you see heading in that direction? Mm. Yeah. I would say that the lesson of the Iraq War in, in the journalistic sphere is the following. And I think it's the wrong lesson. The lesson is that in uh, 2003, 2004, the press was instrumentalized and used to hype a war that that based on false pretenses. So I see in my own newsroom um, this real unease whenever we do stories about the terror threat. The thought is, if we write about ISIS as this scary group, are we, going to, are we essentially being used to justify another invasion, right? I actually think that's the wrong lesson. The lesson of the Iraq war was that we didn't talk to the enemy. We didn't talk to the enemy. We took the assertions of Dick Cheney's uh, associates who spoke anonymously to reporters at the New York Times, at the AP, at the Washington Post, etc., and we published them without sufficient skepticism. Why? Because we didn't have any sources in Iraq. We didn't have sources in Saddam Hussein's government. That is, those were the sources that could have debunked uh, the notion that, that uh, Saddam um, was still holding on uh, to weapons of mass destruction. And that's why I think this line of reporting is important. Whoever our enemy is, whether it's ISIS, whether it's North Korea, whether it's now Iran, we need to have reporters who are making a beat out of speaking to the other side. Because that's, that's where the information that is going to contradict uh, those assertions um, is going to come from. And I've, I've uh, forgotten your second question. <laughs> Mm. Right. So the human to human idea is a journalistic idea for me. I don't know that that would work in terms of law enforcement. Um, probably not. Uh, this is a very brutal group. Um, and so far, the way that America seems to have gotten a handle on the terror threat, as opposed to countries like France and Britain, um, is by imposing excessively long sentences uh, to anyone who is accused of material support for terrorism. But I'll say that the people I know who have managed to pull themselves out of this terror group, they've done so when they were able to see our humanity. And I'll give you an example. Um, Jesse Morton uh, is an American. Uh, he's from New York City. He went on to become one of the most prolific recruiters for Al-Qaeda uh, in the West. He was uh, eventually arrested in Morocco, uh, and he was brought back to the States and spent um, a good amount of time uh, in jail. And he told me about how he had demonized his own country. He had demonized America. And when he gets arrested uh, in Morocco, um, they, they put those earmuffs on him, um, they handcuffed him here and they shackled him. They put him in one of those prison suits. Uh, they blindfolded him. And then they marched him up into a plane. And at that point, he thought he was being taken to Guantanamo. You know, he thought he was being taken to a black site. You know, his life was going to be over. Um, and he remembers how he had a Quran in his hands at the moment when he was arrested. And they took that away from him. When he gets into the plane, uh, the CIA official who was handling his case took off his earmuffs, took off his, um, his blindfolds, uh, and asked him, do you want your Quran back? And gave him his Quran. And he, he talked about that moment um, in a book he's written uh, about his de-radicalization as this moment when things crystallized for him and he thought, you know, the CIA officials who take people to Guantanamo to him were the very worst human beings on the earth. And here was a guy who was offering to give him back his holy book. And he talks about several instances like that. Um, uh, at the jail where he was, there was a jail a warden, a female, a female jail warden, who took pity on him and let him. He was in solitary confinement, and she would allow him out of solitary into the prison library. Acts of kindness like this from the people that he expected to treat him badly um, uh, were, were seminal. 
in allowing him to see that uh, that he had gone in a in a bad direction and to find his way out. Now, can that be used on a larger scale? I don't know, but in the work I do, uh, I think it's absolutely crucial um, to proceed from a place of humanity. Otherwise, these people are not going to speak to me at all. So with the gentleman that you interviewed in the hotel, did he say why he joined ISIS in the first place, why he left Canada? Yes, he, uh, he, he told us the very long story uh, of how he joined. Um, he was uh, a Pakistani immigrant uh, kid. Uh, and even though he's very clear in saying that he was never mistreated uh, as a Muslim in Canada, um, his, uh, his mom wore a veil, uh, she was fine, uh, his father ran a little business, all of the clients and customers were very kind to him and polite, um, but he talks about never quite finding his place uh, in Canada. Um, and a series of events end up precipitating uh, his, his departure into this world. Um, one of them being that he wasn't particularly good at school, um, his parents, being Pakistani immigrants, uh, were very disappointed uh, in him. He felt like he had failed them. Uh, and at the same time that he's, you know, he's living with this, this sense of failure, uh, he discovers these chat rooms online where people just lionized him, you know, where suddenly he was a brother. He was one of this, a member of this community. He was a hero. He was going to go to Syria and protect other Muslims. That's what he thought he was doing. Um, so he went from just being kind of like a loser in his own family setting to being a warrior on this battlefield where in, in the early days and weeks and months of his, uh, of his time there, he thought he was doing a humanitarian thing. He thought he was protecting fellow Muslims. Um, and of course, as you hear in the clip, uh, he realizes along the way that, um, that he's made a, a very grave mistake um, you hear him say, this is not the right jihad. Um, and, and, and that's how he begins to pull out. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, and, uh, your research regarding the origins of ISIS, did you find any connection uh, between the origins of ISIS and the old Saddam Hussein officer corps from the Iraqi army of that day? Thank you for your question, sir. Uh, that is another um, that is another trope that has been repeated about ISIS. Uh, that turns out it has some truth in it, but it has nowhere the amount of truth uh, that that you think. There were some Saddam era officers that were recruited into into ISIS. A few of them held senior roles, but there were not a lot of them. Um, the vast majority of ISIS members. Uh, are Sunnis uh, from Iraq's uh, Sunni triangle uh, that were then uh, complemented by tens of thousands of foreign fighters who came from a total of 100 uh, different countries. Um, I interviewed the most senior Saddam era officer that is still living uh, and that was captured and that is now in jail in Iraq. And he's, he, had, he had gone through the officer's course uh, he was working in intelligence in Saddam's uh, military, but he made the point to me that when Baghdadi recruited him, he was given an administrative role. He became the governor of Kirkuk province, which is basically just like a bureaucrat. So ISIS did not use his Saddam-era intelligence training. It, they, didn't, they didn't make him the head of intelligence. They made him basically uh, you know, a mid-level bureaucrat. Um, and he was among the people who spoke about the fact that you know, it, we, I think what it is is that ISIS is so hard for us to understand. It, their, their acts are so savage, and, and, and yet they've shown you know, a sophistication that is, that is puzzling to us. And so we keep on grasping at things that make sense. Oh, Saddam-era officers. Oh, oil. Oh, this. Oh, that. And we keep on being wrong. <laughs> um, yes, there were some Saddam-era officers, but not a lot. Thank you. Is it on? Yes. Well, I think you probably answered part of what I was curious about. As I was listening to you and you said, well, can anybody identify what these documents are? Um, I'm both a return Peace Corps volunteer and I'm also somebody who has worked with archives. Um, not, in that, not in the part of the world that you were in, but in areas where 
there's a pretty rich colonial history, and one thing that you learn is that there's a pretty strong bureaucratic element that has been introduced yes. in to parts of the world um, that were under like former European colonial powers. So when I see all those documents, um, you know, number one, as an archivist, um, this is something that you go in and they call it provenance, and people usually disregard it, or they don't think it's important, but you actually are reaching something at the primary source and seeing how you know, it was used, which is overlooked, which is not something that's done frequently. One of, one of my other colleagues in the Peace Corps actually did something like that with the invasion of Grenada as part of her service. But The invasion of where? Grenada. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So, I mean, my question is, and he brought it up, is, you know, where to have that infrastructure, even in some place like Mali, um, yeah. how far back does that go into, or would you even get into an area where it talks about, like, you know, colonialism, whether it's the mm. French or the, um, the English, mm. and how that pulls on that, because that's certainly not something we would think about of like, you know, people want to form a militia yeah. and have an uprising, like we have the state of Jefferson people here in Northern California. <laughs> you don't think of them as like, they're, they actually harass people at the state archives all the time over the Bear Flag Revolt, because I know people who work there. Huh. Um, those are not people who are going to want to become bureaucrats from our mindset, at least right. as Northern Californians. but. Right. Right. And other parts of the world, um, you know, again, especially if they've had the French or the English in as colonialism, there's this infrastructure. Yes, yes, that's so interesting. So one of um, one of the most interesting documents that uh, that that I found that 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 was found in Iraq and, in Iraq and Syria, and in fact, it wasn't found by me. It was found by an analyst called Ayman Tamimi. Um, was a document that lays out uh, instru instructions and advice for ISIS and how to govern. And there's a section about how to deal with the administration that was there before. Because obviously they're, they're, they're rolling into cities. Um, the city of Mosul had over a million people. It was a big place. It's the second largest city in, uh, in Iraq. So it already had a civil service core. It had offices. It had a department of electricity. It had uh, a directorate of agriculture. And the interesting thing is that this document put out by ISIS advises ISIS leaders to not dismantle the former administration. Now that doesn't sound like something revolutionary until you think back to what America did when we entered Iraq. And what we did is we passed something called the debathification order, um, which basically called for anyone who had been in the Ba'ath Party to be, um, to be taken out of their functions. And, and since the Ba'ath Party was the ruling party of, uh, of Iraq during the, the Saddam era, that meant that you just gutted the entire civil service. You gutted offices and um, you, basically, you basically got rid of the government, right? Not just the top level, but the people who were running, you know, the electricity central um, or running the water uh, bureau. And that plunged the country into chaos and helped create uh, uh, the chaos that is still there today. ISIS did the opposite. They came into these areas, and within a couple of days of taking over, they made uh, an announcement on the loudspeakers of mosques, and they said that civil servants had to go back to work. So all over Mosul, Raqqa, et cetera, the people who worked at the Directorate of, of Agriculture went back to work. The people who worked at the Public Works Ministry, they went back to work. And when they went back to work, they discovered that their new boss was now a bearded guy um, who looked like he had come out of the seventh century, who was an ISIS guy. Right, um, so they they basically switched out the top two positions. The deputy and the, the emir and the deputy were now ISIS people, but everybody below them was the people that were there before. For a while, the the state just kept running as it ran before, and then little by little, they they started tweaking it. In the Ministry of Agriculture, for example, they got rid of the archaeology department. There's an, in, in, the, in the Iraqi Directorate of Agriculture, there's an archaeology department because in the area around Mosul, the area around Mosul is the Nineveh Plains. The Nineveh Plains are, are mentioned in the Bible, right? Um, this is an incredibly historically and archaeologically rich area. And so the Directorate of Agriculture had an archaeology division which would issue permits when somebody wanted to um, start tilling a field in a particular place to make sure that there were no ruins. Well, ISIS doesn't give a, a care in the world about ruins. They were, in fact, destroying them. So the archaeology department gets, gets folded, right? And little by little, they tweaked it, tweaked it, tweaked it, but they didn't destroy it full on. And I thought that was really interesting, um, that they essentially uh, learned from America's mistake 
um, and did, uh, and did something uh, quite different. Yes. Uh, when hi. you were, hi, when you were um, interviewing government officials and ambassadors and they were saying there's no connective tissue between the Al-Qaeda and Mali and, you know, uh, did you feel that they were, you know, giving you um, incorrect information intentionally or were they just incompetent? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think the people that I was speaking to, this is just my theory, I think the people that I was speaking to were not lying to me. I think they had been told that themselves. Uh, because in fact, the information that this proved that, um, at, at this point, Osama bin Laden has been killed. And in Osama bin Laden's lair in Pakistan, in the town of Abbottabad, um, the CIA had picked up terabytes and terabytes of uh, data off of his computer and documents. Among the documents that were there and that have just now, like about a year ago, been declassified were letters between Osama bin Laden and the head of this group in Mali, showing directly that there was, that there was you know, um, communication between them. What I've heard from people in the intelligence world is that those documents were so tightly held uh, that even members of of other branches of American intelligence weren't able to get them. And at the same time, you were going into an election year. Um, and the sad thing that I've learned is that intelligence is politicized in this country. It's always politicized. When it comes to terror groups, this, this has become a constant. It's always politicized to show the best possible face in terms of the progress we're making against this group. Bin Laden's death was not a small thing. It was a very big loss for Al-Qaeda. But that gets twisted into something even bigger. Not only has Bin Laden been killed, but the entire organization has been decimated. You can have, you can have both things be true. You, you, know, you can say this is a very big blow to Al-Qaeda, but then don't comment on this extra reach, which happened to not be true. And I want to point out that this is something that both sides of the aisle do. Not just Republicans, not just Democrats. Every politician that seems to come in is always presenting uh, this very rosy, very optimistic um, outlook on the war on terror because, quite frankly, no politician can go before the people and say that the war on terror has gotten worse, that terrorism has gotten worse under their watch. In fact, that's what's happened. Um, on the eve of 9-11, uh, Ali Soufan, who was the FBI special agent who was studying uh, this group most closely, he estimated that there were a few hundred members of al-Qaeda globally on the eve of 9-11. Just in Iraq and Syria, right now, after the fall of all of the territory that was under ISIS, the Pentagon is estimating that ISIS, not Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda has its own members, ISIS has between 14,000 and 18,000 members today. A few hundred on the eve of 9-11, 14 to 18,000 of just one of many groups today. So in fact, things are getting worse. <laughs> um, and no administration is going to tell you that. Uh, and so instead what they do is they cherry pick information um, and, and use it to give you the best possible spin on stuff. And it's up to reporters to not be taken in by that. Thank you. Rukmini, I yes. think this is going to be our last question. Gotcha. Oh, good. So I'll try Hi, to sir. make it a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for exploring process. An earlier question asked a little bit about people's motivation. So I want to come up with a couple of quotes that I have favored over the years and then look for a response. And the first one, of course, is from the Israeli general, Moshe Dayan, who said, you don't make peace by talking to your friends. You have to talk to your enemies. And so you've been, you've been doing that, and I appreciate that. The second, however, is from John Paul Lederach, uh, professor of international peace building at Notre Dame, who wrote the week after 9-11, and he said, Military action to destroy terror, particularly as it affects significant and already vulnerable civilian populations, will be like hitting a fully matured dandelion with a golf club. Mm. We will participate in making sure the myth of why we are evil is sustained. Mm -hmm. So I have imagined, and this is the hypothesis I offer you, yeah. is that these groups have a very powerful founding myth mm -hmm. that ungodly Western governments led by the US are attacking and seducing faithful Muslims yeah. in their homes, the Dar al-Islam. Yes. 
They argue, therefore, that all truly faithful Muslims must defend Dar al-Islam by any means possible. So in your view, is that a fair understanding of their myths? And conversely, what do they correctly understand about us? I think you've, you've uh, very expertly described um, their founding myth. The interesting thing is to go back and look at Osama bin Laden's justification for 9-11. Because at that point in time, we were not involved uh, in, in these, these wars uh, in the Middle East. One of the justifications for 9-11 was the presence of US troops in Saudi Arabia. It was portrayed in bin Laden's uh, lingo as a violation. But in fact, US troops were there at the invitation of the kingdom. It was not an invasion. Right? But just the very mere presence of US troops in uh, a Muslim land uh, was seen as, um, as, as something that tarnished uh, Islam. And unfortunately, uh, our actions have played into their hands and into this particular myth, because at this point, the US government does have the blood of Muslims on its hands. Tens of thousands of civilians have been killed in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, in other places as a result of American and coalition airstrikes. Um, and, and, and that just keeps on perpetuating uh, uh, the founding myth, as you, as, you, as you put it. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here tonight. So, Rukmini, let me say just a huge thank you to you. Uh, thank you for doing the work that you do. Thank you for your courage and your, your vis vision, your, your wisdom in what you do. Um, as a preacher, I, I'm aware tonight, not a, you've educated us, but you, you've also sort of challenged us, for me, at a spiritual level. I, I find myself thinking of Jesus saying, love your enemies. I think of Jesus saying, do to other people what you want them to do to you. And it seems to me you're holding up that standard against the way that we're behaving in the international arena, and you're pushing us, and we need to be pushed. Amen? You know? So thank you for pushing us. Thank you for educating us. Uh, and thank you for being the extraordinary human being that you are. Thank you so much.